Hi everyone, in today's video we're going to talk about how a non-uniform polarization in a dielectric material can give rise to a volume density of bound charge and we'll derive an equation that links that volume density of bound charge to the polarization vector. Now depending on how much you already know about this sort of stuff it might be useful to first take a look at my previous video in which I introduced dielectrics and the polarization vector because uh, this video builds on some of those ideas however it's not strictly necessary and hopefully you'll still be able to follow this one either way. So what we're dealing with here is a dielectric material that has an external electric field applied to it and the electric field may not be uniform in other words it may vary with position and the effect of the field is going to be to cause all of the little positive and negative charges within the dielectric to separate and you'll get a lot of little dipole moments being induced and mathematically we describe that using the polarization vector p which is the dipole moment per unit volume now because the polarization vector can vary with position since we have a non-uniform electric field the strategy has to be to split our uh, material into infinitely many infinitesimally small volume elements over which we can consider the polarization vector to be constant and I've shown in my diagram three such elements here which happen to be aligned along what I've called the y-axis. Now because these are infinitesimal cuboids uh, aligned with this Cartesian coordinate system it would make sense to label the sides as follows it's called that one dy, uh, this one dx and the vertical one dz. Now I also want to label some of the coordinates of the centers of the cuboids. Those are the x's that I've put uh, inside each of the cuboids. I don't need to bother labeling the x and z coordinates because they're all the same for these three boxes because they lie along a line parallel to the y-axis. So I'm just going to label the y-coordinates. Let's define the middle one just to be at y. Now notice that I've drawn the cuboids with little gaps between them like this. That's purely so that the diagram is clearer to understand. Those gaps don't actually exist and you have to imagine um, pushing the cuboids so that they're directly in contact and then you can hopefully see that the distance between the centers of the cuboids will be the same as the width of the cuboids in other words dy and that means the y coordinate of the cuboid on the right is y plus dy and the one on the left is at y minus dy. Now the effect of the polarization as we discussed last time is going to be to induce charges on the surface of each of these cuboids and uh, because the polarization is in an arbitrary direction each of those six faces could in general have some charge on it and we want to come up with labels for those charges so that we can start thinking about the uh, volume density of charge overall. Now I want to start by focusing on the faces which are perpendicular to the y-axis in other words the faces on the far right and far left of each cube the ones that I've just drawn uh, arrows towards and I'm going to label the one on the right as q subscript y which is a function of x y and z now here x y and z are just the coordinates of the center of that cube and the subscript y indicates that it's a charge um, on a surface which is perpendicular to the y-axis now by conservation of charge the opposite face has to have an equal and opposite amount of charge uh, it's going to be then just minus q y um, also as a function of the same coordinates because it's part of the same cube. So I've just similarly labeled the uh, charges on the left and right faces of the far right cube. They look very similar. The only difference is that the y coordinate has changed to y plus dy. We can still call them qy because that's a function that can depend on position. And of course we can do the same thing on the left hand cube except the y coordinate is now y minus dy instead. So the next thing we want to know is how can we write those accumulated charges um, in terms of the polarization vector p. So I'm just going to start by writing down um, q subscript y as a function of r, um, which is shorthand for x, y, z, is equal to. Now remember that dipole moment is defined as charge times separation, and uh, therefore we can use that backwards and say that charge is dipole moment divided by separation. The dipole moment we can get in terms of uh, the polarization vector because polarization is dipole moment per unit volume. So if we want the y part of the charge, the charge that accumulates on the faces perpendicular to the, uh, the y-axis, we take the y component of the polarization, let's call it p subscript y, multiply it by the volume of one of the cubes, which of course is just dx dy dz, divided by the separation, which is going to be dy because those left hand and right hand faces are separated only along the, uh, the y-axis, and the dy's cancel and you get the y component of polarization multiplied by dx dz. Now remembering that we're aiming for an expression for the volume density of induced charge, it would be helpful to have an expression for the total charge which is accumulated on that central cube. For now we're only going to consider the contribution from the faces perpendicular to the y-axis, we'll add in um, contributions appropriate to the x and z axes later on. 
Um, firstly, notice that this qy of x, y, and z is on the central cube. And we just derived that we can write qy as py dx dz. So I'm going to start by writing py um, dx dz. But also remember that the cubes are actually in contact. And therefore, the left-hand face of the right-hand cube is also touching the middle cube, right? And so this minus qy um, of y plus dy is also contributing to the charge on the middle cube. I'm going to write that down um, using a sort of shorthand notation based on this py dx dz thing. I'm going to write it as minus um, py plus dpy. In other words, py plus a little increment um, in py multiplied by dx dz. Now we do the same for the left-hand face of the middle cube. We get minus py dx dz. That's coming from uh, this minus qy term. And then we've got to deal with this qy of y minus dy. Um, by the same uh, logic as before, I can write this as plus py minus that same little increment in py times uh, dx dz. Now this expression is almost but not quite correct. The complication is that the cuboids are in contact and if we go with this expression we are going to be double counting all of the charge. In other words we're going to be counting the charge on each face as being part of the cube on the left of that face and part of the cube on the right of that face. I think the way to resolve this is to imagine that the surfaces are not perfectly two-dimensional but rather that they have some very very small but finite thickness. After all we live in a three-dimensional world and there's no such thing as a perfectly two-dimensional object. Then if we imagine that the charge is uniformly spread throughout that entire uh, very very thin surface you can see that half of it will be uh, part of one cube and half of it will be part of the other cube and so we really want to halve this entire expression so that we don't double count our charges. So now we can just do some simplifying. Notice that the py dx dz terms just cancel. Uh, we've got this factor of a half in front. Um, you've also got a uh, py dx dz here which is negative and another positive version there. So those cancel as well um, and you're just left with minus 2 dpy small increment in py um, times dx dz and then the half cancels with the 2 and simplifies nicely to minus dpy dx dz. So all we have to do to convert that into a volume density of charge is divide that by our volume element. Um, so if we call that volume density rho, uh, it's going to be minus dpy dx dz divided by um, dx dy dz. dx dz cancels and you get minus um, dpy um, by dy. And I'm writing this as a partial derivative now because we're interpreting our ratio of differentials as a derivative, but py can depend on all three um, coordinates. And so we're emphasizing that we're specifically differentiating with respect to y here. So this is what we've got so far, but remember that we haven't said anything about the faces perpendicular to the z and x axes just yet. Now the logic of course is going to be exactly the same except instead of the y-axis being the special axis it's going to be the x and then the z-axis. And when we add all of those charges together to find the total charge on all six faces of that middle cube and divide by the volume you're going to get contributions, uh, symmetrical contributions from each direction, right? So of course we're going to have minus dpx um, by dx and then minus dpz by dz and in vector calculus notation we can write this very compactly as minus the divergence of p. Now let's try to come up with a nice physical interpretation of that equation that we've just derived and to do that we want to consider an arbitrary volume like this blob that I've just drawn here bounded by some closed surface. Now note that the divergence of a vector field is a measure of the flux of that vector field through a surface and I guess in more uh, understandable language that's basically saying it's a measure of the extent to which a vector field is emerging coming out from some particular surface. So if p had a positive divergence that would mean that on the whole uh, your p vector field is tending to come out of the bounding surface of this volume. Um, obviously it might maybe it goes in somewhere but uh, on the whole uh, it's going more out than it's going in. Now remember that Polarization is a measure of dipole moment, and dipole moment by definition points from negative charge to positive charge. So if your P vector field is pointing outwards, that means you're tending to uh, take positive charges 
and put them outside your volume. You have your bits coming in there as I've drawn it, but mostly positive charge going out of the volume, leaving behind negative charges uh, generally inside the volume. So even without having gone through that whole derivation, we would have expected purely on physical grounds that if the divergence of P were positive, then we should be left with a negative charge density within that particular volume. And this is consistent with what we've got here because of that minus sign in front of the divergence. So it does uh, make quite a lot of physical sense. So let's finish there. Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.